All right, everybody. Welcome to the afternoon session. The first talk will be given by Professor Klaus Enslin from ETH Zurich, and he's going to be telling us about graphene quantum devices. <clears throat> so let me start by thanking the organizers for putting together this program and for having me here. Thanks a lot. <clears throat> I will shift gears quite a bit compared to what you have heard before. It's of course also in the general topic, quantum information and solid state physics, but it will be uh, about graphene. So here is a landscape of uh, various qubit technologies that are used for quantum computers. I don't think it's exhaustive, but uh, you see all the optical and ion traps on this side, all the solid state system on this side. I think before lunch, we just had a wonderful talk about the uh, superconducting qubits. Uh, there are the uh, spin-based qubits, which have also made it into industry. On the silicon basis, Intel is working on this, many experimental groups on that. <clears throat> and uh, my goal is to convince you that uh, graphene is a wonderful basis for a future quantum information processor. So gallium arsenide, I think, is the pioneer. Gallium arsenide is where many of the basic quantum dot features have been investigated. All the readout schemes that we use today, all of that has been done in gallium arsenide. They started about 20 years ago. Gallium arsenide has a major advantage in the sense that it's a very clean system. And as an experimentalist, almost anything you would like to implement, you actually can. And we have seen that also from quantum ball physics. Uh, silicon is now the workhorse because silicon is compatible with industry and silicon has advantages in the sense that spin orbit interaction is weak in silicon. And with silicon, you can actually provide versions that are isotopically purified. So you get rid of nuclear spins. All of that has been done in industry and in various labs around the world. And graphene, I think, is the future. Many people haven't recognized that yet, but I think uh, there are many way, many steps that need to be taken, but it has a lot of potential. So why silicon? Well, if you just take natural carbon, it consists to 99% out of carbon-12, and that's not just graphene, that's true for carbon nanotubes or anything built out of uh, carbon. So without doing anything, you are all already 99% nuclear spin-free, and of course, you can use carbon that is on top of that isotopically purified. And then if you look at carbon itself, the carbon is element number six in the periodic table. The strength of spin orbit interaction generally increases with the size of the atom that you use. So I would say carbon is almost the lightest element in the periodic table with which you can build something reasonably well in, in solid state physics. So theoretically, one expects long spin coherence times because these major decoherence mechanisms are expected to be weak. But as I will show you, the road to measure spin coherence times is a long one. We are not completely there, but we're getting there. So this is, I think, uh, a book that I grew up with, and I think many of us grew up with who worked in semiconductor physics. This is the band structure of silicon with an indirect gap and the band structure of gallium arsenide with a direct gap. And we know all of these gaps are very important for applications, to build transistors, to build lasers and stuff like that. Now, if you look at the band structure of graphene, you see it has this famous linear dispersion. It has no band gap. So at first glance, it's a useless system to build a transistor because you can switch off that transistor. Now, if you have single layer graphene, uh, we know that you can also go <clears throat> to bilayer graphene and bilayer graphene has again, no gap, but rather than having a linear dispersion, it has a parabolic dispersion. And the nice thing about bilayer graphene is that you can break the symmetry between the layers by applying a vertical electric field. And if you do that, then you start opening up a band gap between these layers because the orbitals that couple to each other, they start having uh, anti-symmetric properties and therefore you open up a band gap. And I show you a blow up of this band gap here, and you see it's not actually just a, a parabolic dispersion anymore as it was without the electric field, but you get something like a Mexican headband structure that has this symmetry, and that has the height of a few milli electron volts for a gap of a few 10 milli electron volts, which are small numbers compared to other solid state systems, but these are huge numbers if you compare it to measurement temperatures in the millikelvin range. 
So for us, this band gap is actually very large. And the interesting thing here is that this Mexican hat has actually an energy scale, which is comparable with most of the other energy scales in the problem, like confinement energies, charging energies. And this brings topology right there into the system. So topology is built into bilayer graphene and it's tunable by an electric field. <clears throat> so now let me walk you through the technology as we call it. Technology, it's still done with sticky tape like in the early days when graphene was invented. So you start out with a piece of graphite. On top of that, you put hexagonal boronitrite, you cover it with bilayer graphene, cover it again with hexagonal boronitrite. Then you etch a little down to the graphene, make two ohmic contacts here, and you place a top gate here, which allows you to control the carrier density from the top. The graphite controls it from the back, and that allows you to tune this electric field that you need to open up a gap. And you have two gate electrodes, which is necessary because you have two degrees of freedom. One of them is the field across the device, that's the displacement field. And the other one is that once you have opened up a gap, you want to position your Fermi level in the gap. So these two degrees of freedom, you can control with the top and with a backing. Uh, let me mention here our friends in Japan, Professor Watanabe and Taniguchi. These are the ones who make hexagonal boronitrite. Uh, basically, they are co-authors on all major graphene papers these days. They have about 10 papers per day. I recommend you to check their age index and their publication record. This is uh, simply stunning what they have done. And they, they are driving the entire field without them. I think nobody could do anything. Okay, <clears throat> so let me show you here the layout of our device. So we start out, as I said, with a graphite backgate, then it, uh, the dashed uh, lines here, they mark the bilayer graphene. Then we add the, the green gates, we call them the split gates, and we tune these split gates together with a backgate such that the material is gapped below the green gates and depleted, namely that the Fermi level is in the gap. So you can think of it in the following way. You pass a current through the system from source to drain. Now, once you activate the green gates together with the back gate, the current has to go through this narrow channel. And now you have these blue gates on top of the green gates and the, the blue gates, they allow you to locally tune the chemical potential along this channel. So once you have established this channel, you can actually do gate defined confinement very similar as you can do it in gallium arsenide or in silicon. I should say that ideas like that have been around for a very long time and it never really worked because the gaps were never large enough and you could never deplete the system. These days now this is under control and we actually have uh, very nicely controlled structures as you will see. So let's start out with a very simple system here. We tune the back gate so that the entire system is p-doped, contains holes. Then we tune the split gates. So as I said, no carriers below these wide areas. So the current flows through the narrow channel. And let's just have one single gate, the red dashed line on top of everything that basically controls what's happening in this little island here. It doesn't affect anything where you have already covered the system with the white gates because they simply screen what's happening from the top, top gate. So you see there's a finite conductance that you measure through your system, and that is defined by the width and the length of your channel. Schematically on the bottom, you see the band structures in the source and the drain. So we are in the, in the valence band. The Fermi level is at the top of the valence band. We have holes. In the channel, we have also P-type carrier. So this is a P-type channel. Now you tune this gate in such a way that you also position the Fermi level in the gap here. So in the center, the Fermi level is in the gap. And that means that the conductance goes down to zero. Now you keep tuning this red dash gate and you start accumulating electrons here. And you see very nice Coulomb blockade oscillations. So one electron after the other enters the system. And the interesting thing is now that the tunneling barriers are PN junctions. It's not like standard uh, uh, depletion gates in gallium arsenide. This is an N-type island with a well-controlled electron number, which is coupled to P-type leads by PN junctions. Now, if you look at these peaks in a little bit more detail, you can, and I will say a little bit more about that, you can actually fill it with individual electrons. And all of that is completely gate defined. So what you can do is you can invert the gate voltages on your system, make an N-type channel, 
make the standard barriers, make a p-type dot. And this is what you find in the very same sample. You start filling it with holes, one, two, three, four holes. And this is very electron hole symmetric so that you can play with these carriers in the very same sample, which is a big thing in silicon, but which is basically standard in all carbon-based devices. Now let's have a closer look here in just an electron-like quantum dot that we fill here in this case with 24 electrons. So this trace shows you a little bit about the qualities that you can achieve, the, the thinness of the Coulomb peaks. It's comparable to the best silicon and gallium arsenide samples. Now on the bottom, uh, what you see here is the difference between the peaks. So basically the energy costs you to fill in an additional electron in your system. And we know from these Coulomb blockade oscillations that you pay basically a classical energy, which is the capacitance of your system. And you pay a quantum energy, which you have to pay if an electron, for example, goes into the next orbital state. So what you see on the bottom is here that basically all of these energies are on the scale of roughly 0.15 volts on this scale on energy. This means roughly five milli electron volts. And you see, you have to pay a lot of energy for electron number four, electron number 12, and electron number 24. So why is that? And I'm showing this to you because it tells you that by trying to build a nice qubit, there is some interesting physics along the way, and you can understand it because graphene is a very simple system. So the first four electrons, they go into the same orbital state. Why do they do that? In a standard semiconductor system, you have a spin degeneracy of two. In graphene, you have another degeneracy, which is the valley degeneracy. You see, because you have this hexagonal lattice in real space, this honeycomb lattice, this translates into a hexagonal lattice in k-space. This lattice in k-space has two inequivalent points in k-space, k and k-prime, and that gives rise to an additional degeneracy. All of that is related to the fact that in real space, in order to have the primitive unit cell of the hexagonal lattice, you have two atoms per unit cell. You cannot build a unit cell with only one atom. Because of that, you have two points in k-space. And because of that, you can basically see that in the quantum dot, you get this additional degree of freedom. So the first state is fourfold degenerate, two for spin, two for valley. And therefore the first four electrons, they sit in the same orbital state. Now for the next electron, you go from S to P, so you have to pay additional energy. <clears throat> and therefore from electron four to 12, the next eight electrons, they go into the P state. In two dimensions, the P state is twofold degenerate. So you get two for the orbital degeneracy, two for spin, two for valley, that gives you eight. So the next eight electrons go into the P state. So you see how you can understand the occupation of the system. Now, the interesting thing is the next electrons they have a 12-fold sort of degeneracy. What is that 12-fold degeneracy? And again, it's related to the band structure. We always think of graphene as having these cones in the band structure. If it's bilayer graphene, you have a parabolic bottom, but you still have this rotational symmetry. But of course, there is no rotational symmetry in real life because you have a hexagonal lattice. So all of those cones are not actually circular, but they have a triangular symmetry, which is called trigonal warping. And usually this is a feature that happens at very high energies in the band structure. Here we are talking low energies, but because we apply this huge electric field to open up a gap, we are pushing this high energy features in the band structure down to lower energies. And so the trigonal warping actually plays a role. And what happens is that uh, you basically get a, a band structure that leads to an additional degeneracy. I'm showing you here a calculation which was done by Angelica Knote and Volotia Falco in Manchester. This is a calculation without spin and valley degeneracy. So you see the first state is a single state, that's the S state. The next P state is twofold degenerate. And then you get higher lying states, no more than twofold degeneracy because we had two dimensions. Now, if you just change the size of the dot, so you go from 80 nanometers to 200 nanometers, if you make it larger in real space, you make it smaller in k-space. If you make it smaller in k-space, you see that you get these features that arise from trigonal warping that give additional minima, if you want, in your quantum dot. So you get a threefold degeneracy from trigonal warping, two for spin and two for valley, that gives you 12. 
And that explains the additional de uh, degeneracy that we saw. So you can understand all of those features by looking into the band structure of graphene. Now, let's see how we fill in these states with spins and with valleys. So what you see here is again, gate voltage access. We are filling here the first four electrons. And these lines here is just the Coulomb peaks from before. And we follow them as a function of a parallel magnetic field. The parallel magnetic field in plane, it only couples to the spin degree of freedom and not to the valley degree of freedom. So you see the first two lines, they go down in energy, which means they are filled with the same spin direction. So the first two electrons, the first electron goes in like that, second goes in like that, but with opposite valley. That's why they can do that. Now, electrons number three and four, they come in with the opposite spin direction and obviously also opposite valleys. And then if you look for electron number five to eight, they lean to the left. So these are four electrons with the same spin. And then you go for the next four electrons and they go again with the opposite spin. So these are Huns rules for a periodic table, which is modified compared to our conventional periodic table. First, because it's two dimensional. And second, because we have a new degree of freedom, the valley degree of freedom. And I think this valley degree of freedom is a fantastic degree of freedom because it changes a lot of things. So on the bottom, you see these slopes plotted in terms of G factors. And for carbon, you expect a G factor of two. So you see this minus two plus two, minus four plus four. And then for those intermediate 12 elect, life gets more complicated and you get interactions because you have many carriers in your system. And then life is not so easy to understand anymore. But nevertheless, we have a good understanding for the first few electrons. <clears throat> now, uh, again, what do you do now? We have a good quantum dot. We know how many carriers we have in the quantum dot. We know what their spin and valley quantum numbers are. Now you want to find out what the lifetimes are. How long do these states actually live? And in order to do that, you need a charge detector. This has been implemented again in gallium arsenide like probably 30 years ago, silicon maybe 15 years ago. And what we do is we take these bluish gates, you recognize them, and we define them such that there are no carriers between those gates. So now we have two carrying, uh, current carrying channels, the upper one and the lower one. In the upper one, we define one of those quantum dots with a well-defined electron number. And in the bottom, we have another constriction or dot or something whose conductance is very sensitive to the electrostatic environment. So if we then fill an electron into the upper channel, we can see a change in conductance in the lower channel. And that allows us to monitor the charge occupation real time in the upper channel. And it allows us in particular to do a time resolved conductance measurement. So now I show you what happens if you just fill in one electron into your system and we want to measure the lifetime of the spin in that electron. That's sort of the first experiment that you would like to do if you want to measure a spin qubit. So what you do is you take the two spin split states. So you apply a small magnetic field. Zeeman splitting is larger than KT. You, you get the two states below the Fermi levels of source and drain. You fill in one electron. This one electron goes either into the upper or the lower state. In the read phase, you move the upper Zeeman state above the Fermi levels, the lower spin states below. So if you have filled the upper state, then the electron can escape to the lead and is replaced by a spin with the opposite direction. Or if the lower one was occupied, nothing happens because it's below the Fermi levels of source and brain. And then you unload the system and reload it again. And that's the schematic of the sample here on the bottom. So here is a typical trace. This is a trace of the detector now. That's the detector signal. And this is a detector signal as a function of time. So we have loaded an electron into your, our quantum dot. And now it so happens that we have loaded into the excited state. So the detector signal shoots up. It says the electron has left my quantum dot. And then it comes down again. So another electron has come in. And that tells me that now we have basically filled in an excited state electron. And at the end, we have a ground state electron. This feature here we call a blip. And this is a sign of the fact that we have measured an excited state electron. Here is another typical measurement where nothing happens during the lifetime of the detector. And that means we have filled in the ground state. And now you can do statistics to measure many traces like that. And every time we have a blip, we can say that we have an electron that had a certain lifetime in the excited state. 
So what I show you in the following now is basically the number of blips, the relative number of blips, the features that we see as a function of the load time. So if you make the load time very, very long, what happens is even if you fill the electron in the upper state, it has time to relax during the load time and you will never see any of those blips. So the number of blips goes to zero as you have very long load times. If your load time is very short, you might not even load an electron in your system because your load time might be shorter than the time it takes to tunnel into your system. So you also don't see any blips. But if you hit the right target here, in our case, around 10 milliseconds or so, then you actually load an electron in the excited state. You can measure its lifetime there. You see how it decays and uh, you get these two exponentials and that allows you to get out the T1 time of the spin in this quantum dot. And we find numbers here that are around 50 milliseconds. So that's a pretty good number. It's comparable to the best that people have seen in silicon and gallium arsenide. And uh, it shows us that things are going well. But let's not forget that there's another degree of freedom here, which is the valley degree of freedom. And our states have both of these quantum numbers and they are characterized by those. <clears throat> you can also check it as a function of magnetic field and so forth. So uh, that's sort of speak measuring the T1 time of the spin. But now you can move one step further and you can measure the lifetime of the valley. But in order to do that, you need to have actually two carriers in your system. And now have to ask yourself, I always talked about filling in one electron ground state of the second, the third and so forth. But now if you want to measure basically T2 times or something related to the valley, you need two carriers. And the typical feature that people have used for, for many years again is called Pauli blockade. And here you see what it means. This is a standard system, two carriers. And the two carriers, as we know, they can go into the singlet or the triplet state. Now what happens is that this I, number here, one, one means one carrier is on the left, one is on the right. If these two carriers are in separate quantum dots, their wave functions hardly overlap. Therefore, the exchange interaction is very small and the singlet triplet is very small. That's indicated by these lines here. If the two carriers are in the same quantum dot, their wave functions overlap and the exchange energy is large and the triplet typically is very high and outside our window. So what happens now is if you basically fill, let's assume you have one electron in your system with one spin, if you fill in the second one with the same spin, then they happen to be in a triplet state, a triplet one, one, but the triplet two zero is high up in energy. So the carrier cannot move through your system. And that's what we call Pauli blockade. If an opposite carrier comes, goes into the singlet state, the singlet state is the same for the one to zero configuration and then it can pass. So that's how people have looked at that for a long time. Now the situation changes completely when you have another degree of freedom. So I told you that we have a fourfold degeneracy at zero magnetic field. Actually, that's not completely true because there's a finite amount of spin orbit splitting. There's a K milli type of spin orbit splitting in graphene and it's of the order of 50 to 100 micro electron volts. It's established by many experiments now. It's a small number, but it's larger than KT. So actually at zero magnetic field, we get two Kramer doublets. And these two Kramer doublets are basically, you have a spin up, valley down, spin down, valley up. And the uh, additional thing for the upper two states. So you get two of these Kramer doublets and these Kramer doublets actually split in a magnetic field. They split for two reasons. They split because of the Zeeman splitting but I told you that this, um, uh, um, this valley degree of freedom, it has basically a, a component in K space. It has a finite Berry curvature and the Berry curvature acts like a magnetic moment if you apply a perpendicular magnetic field. The valley degree of freedom is an orbital degree of freedom, but it has the same statistics as a spin degree of freedom. Therefore, you can associate a G factor with that, a valley G factor. And this valley G factor is actually huge. In this case, it's around 10 to 20, but there is data in the literature where it can go up to 1000. It depends on the size of your quantum dot, on the confinement of the magnitude on the Berry curvature. And the interesting feature is that it becomes a tunable parameter. So if you think about the value of a two level system, it has a G factor like a spin, 
but it's a tunable G factor. And it's not tunable by 10%, it's tunable actually by orders of magnitude. So what happens is that these two states, they split apart with a valley G factor. One has additionally spin up and the other spin down. So it's not exactly that they go in the same direction. If you say the valley G factor is 20, the spin G factor is two, then one goes down with 22 and the other one goes up with 18. The same happens for the upper doublet. And you see, you get crossings here, various crossings in this very simple single particle spectrum. Okay, I have to move. Okay, so let me move fast. If you go to two particles, it becomes more complicated because you have two particles. You have two, you know, the Hilbert space for two particles is four, three triplets and a singlet. Now, if you add another two, because it's a Hilbert space, it goes into the exponent. You actually get 16 states because now you can have singlets and triplets for spin and for valley. And you have to ask yourself, what is the ground state? And it so happens that the ground state is a spin triplet and a valley singlet. I think that's the only system I know where you put two carriers into your system and they have a, a triplet spin ground state. So and there are many consequences like that. And that's why the ground state here is basically composed of these valley singlets and spin triplets. Now you can look at three particles, four particles and so forth, I will skip that. And now you look at this spin blockade and the spin blockade now could mean that you're spin blocked, valley blocked or spin and valley blocked, which is indicated here. You can imagine you go to the details, you understand that I will walk over that and you can nail down these various situations and you can especially, we, we looked at a few of those experimentally because we have a finite amount of time. You see these um, <clears throat> uh, blockade configurations. These are these bias triangles for the specialists that are blocked in one bias direction. You see here at the baseline, they are blocked in one bias direction while they are here. And the blocking depends on how quickly you can flip your quantum number. And um, that's our motto here. And the important thing is that what, what we see, let me move by, because time is flying. We do the same experiment as we did before, but now for the two carrier state, the singlet state, and depending on where we are, we can actually measure the spin decay time or the valley decay time. Uh, sorry, that's too fast for you to understand. Let me just walk through that. Let me go to the final result because I think that's interesting. So for the spins, we find again, times of around 10 to 50 milliseconds, similar to other materials. But for the valleys, we have here 300 milliseconds. Actually, these days we find times that are longer than 10 seconds. And some of them are so long that we can't measure them anymore. The problem is if there are 10 seconds and you want to measure a thousand events, you have good statistics, you have a problem in your lab. Now, this is good news. Long times are good news. It's also bad news because it means that the states are very little coupled to the environment. And that's why they are hard to manipulate. So why do they live so long? Basically, we are talking about two K states that are far apart in the Brion zone. You have to basically cross the Brion zone in order to flip the K. That requires an atomic scattering event. And probably these samples are so clean that there is no atomic scattering event. And that's why these valley states are so long lived. Okay. Now, let me just mention what we can also do in relation to the previous talk. You know, we can twist graphene layers. By twisting graphene layers, you can make them superconducting. And then you can build a, a Josephson junction, a monolithic Josephson junction in one and the same material. Here it looks like that. It's again boronitride. You remember that magic angle graphene in between. You have gates on top. And now with these various gates on top, you can locally build an insulating state. You can build a superconducting state. You can build a correlated insulator. You can have a metal with flat bands or a metal with a, a finite dispersion. And uh, you can basically measure uh, the characteristics of a Josephson junction. You apply a high frequency and you see very nice Shapiro steps. So that's just to indicate that you can take the superconducting material and tune it in various regimes. In particular, you can build a Josephson junction. You can also drill a hole in the center and uh, have basically two barriers on top of a bottom. So now we have obviously a non singly connected structure and we build a squid with a particular feature that we can control the uh, strength of the barriers on top and bottom. And we can see very nice H over two periodic oscillations. 
Now, because this is a hand-built structure, this is a very asymmetric squid, but we have barriers left and right, so we can make the squid symmetric, and then it looks as good as a standard squid. So you really see these oscillations, and you can build that in the device. You can go one step beyond and just build ring-defined structures and observe little parks oscillations of the superconductor, and that has strong implications because it might tell you something about the order parameter of the superconductor. And here are, uh, uh, sorry, the current is gone here. These are critical current oscillations in the magnetic field that nicely tells you that this is a well-defined system. So <clears throat> now we can dream a little bit, right? Uh, we can build Josephson junctions in our systems. We can build very nice quantum dots. So you could think of making spin qubits. You could dream about valley qubits. We still have to get there. We build Josephson junctions. So we might be able to build a transmon in magic angle graphene. You get the topology for free. It's even tunable by gate voltages. And you have this additional valley degree of freedom, which you could argue makes life complicated. But as a physicist, I would say it makes life more interesting because it gives you more tuning knobs in your system. And you have all of this in the very same material system, and all of this can be controlled by gate voltages. So I think that's a unique opportunity where you can play with these different types of qubits and uh, try to build systems that are not possible otherwise. Okay, that brings me to the end of my presentation. I thank my collaborators who did all of that work, and I thank you for your attention.